Any guesses who that is? When I was about that age, I had three favorite Bible stories. One, David and Goliath. You know, well, why? Because it involved a giant that got, like, taken down by a little kid throwing a stone. Inspiring and a little bit dangerous. Second one, it's Noah's Ark. Well, why? Because it involved a whole bunch of animals and the destruction of the entire world. You don't have to teach boys about violence. We are like drawn to it naturally. Loved that story. Third one was this one, Daniel in the lion's den. If you're not familiar with that story, let me give you a summary. It's Daniel 6, verse 16. It says, so the king gave the order and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. This guy, Daniel, he was thrown into a den of lions for following God. But, spoiler alert, if you don't want to hear the end yet, plug your ears. God protects Daniel. He doesn't get eaten by the lion. So the typical teaching is along the lines of, well, God saved Daniel from the lions and he will save you. He will save you. Whatever lion you are facing today, and that is a comforting teaching, but if I've been digging into Daniel chapter 6, I'm not so sure that that's true. I'm not even sure. That's what Daniel 6 is about. See, as I got older, I heard about other stories. Have you ever heard the story about Ignatius, the bishop of Antioch? He was one of the early followers of Jesus. On December 20, 111 A.D., Ignatius stood in the Roman Colosseum. The animal gate was opened, and two lions came out. You know what happened to Ignatius? Well, this. When friends came to collect his body for burial, only a few scraps of bone remained. Why don't we tell that story to the kids? What do we do with that? Why did God protect Daniel from the lions, but not Ignatius? Want to know what I think? I think Daniel chapter 6 is famous, but often misunderstood. We're teaching through the book of Daniel. Today we get to Daniel chapter 6, probably the most well-known part of this entire book of Daniel. Here's what's going on. Daniel, by this time, he's an old man, probably around 80 years old. A new king has just ascended to the throne. His name is Darius. Chapter 6 starts this way, verse 1. It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. So the satraps, they're kind of like governors, regional leaders. And Daniel, he is given a position above them. He's one of the top three in the land. Verse 4, at this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs. We know this dynamic. We know what this is. This, this is a case of workplace jealousy. These guys, they were jealous because Daniel was a little bit higher than them, and so they were going to do what they could do to take him down. And imagine if, if this happened in your life, what they did to Daniel here. If they got the FBI and the CIA and maybe even throw in TMZ to vet you, what would they find? You know, any kind of financial mismanagement. They would scour your social media history, every website that you've ever visited. They'd interview the people of your past, you know, high school romances, old roommates, your every employer that you've ever had. Verse 4, they did that. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. The end of this vetting, they're like, we got nothing. 
Daniel's character, it was impeccable. There was a day when what you did in your private life was thought to have no or little bearing with your public life. That day, thankfully, is gone. It's over, right? Just ask people like John Gruden or Harvey Weinstein. You know, thankfully, we've come to recognize that who you are behind closed doors, that matters. It matters, it matters, because we don't live two lives. We live one life. It's all connected. What we do, what we say, how we treat people, it's a reflection of who we are. Do you want to know the best way to prevent spiteful peers from finding your dirt? Don't get dirty. Don't do something today that you may want to hide tomorrow. It's called integrity. And the followers of Jesus have a head start on this because Jesus, he's been saying that's the best way to do life for a couple thousand years. See, these guys, they they tried, but they couldn't find anything wrong with Daniel's life. And so they went after his faith. That's what's next. Verse 7. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. It's a clever idea. It's an appeal to the king's ego. Well, the king agrees, he makes the law. Verse 10, now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. And before we admire that, I want us just to pause and to think about that, what Daniel did. Is there a verse in the Bible that says, Thou shalt bow down in front of a window facing Jerusalem and pray to God three times a day? No! Right? There there isn't a commandment like that in the Bible. There's no commandment to pray three times a day. There's no commandment to pray facing Jerusalem. And there's certainly no commandment in the Bible to pray in front of an open window. Nowhere in, in the Bible do we see that. So that changes what happens in Daniel 6 a little bit. See, what's going on in Daniel 6, this isn't about Daniel following God's law. This is about Daniel saying, I'm not willing to give up my spiritual habit. That's different. I look at this and I think, dude, you're you're like 80 years old. Can't you just take one month off? I'm like, Daniel, it's not like they're asking you to bow down to an idol. Just pray somewhere else. You know, relocate. Why don't you just have your prayer time instead of in the open window, maybe relocate it to the shower. You're 80 years old. I don't think anyone's going to be watching you in there. (laughs) But Daniel, he doesn't do that. So why? Why did Daniel do what he did? I think this part of this passage is really cool. Like this part. See, here's what's happening. Daniel, he's not praying to God because he has to. He's praying to God because he wants to. Daniel's been doing this for years. He has this rich spiritual habit. He's developed this life pattern where he scheduled God into his day three times a day, every single day. And he's like, I can't just walk away from that. Because that is so important. That is such a rich part of my day. I'm not going to let that go. I'm not just going to give that up. That just tight. I'm tight with God. I hear from God during those moments. I'm not giving that up. 
Daniel wasn't required to do that. He wanted to do that because of this lifelong spiritual habit that he had that was so deeply meaningful to him. He learned how to hear and how to share and how to connect deeply with God. Anybody else want that? Do you want to have a relationship with God that goes beyond just a a belief in your head? Where you're like, yeah, you know, I kind of believe that there is a God. And if I'm going to check off a box saying, which religion are you? I'm probably going to check off the Christian box. Do you want a relationship with God that is more meaningful and vibrant than that? Because the Bible says over and over and over and over again, you can That's God's desire for you, and that's God's desire for me. Well, what does it take? It takes a little bit of intentionality. Us doing things like this, saying, God, I'm going to prioritize you in my life. I'm going to create space to just hang out with you. So if you want that kind of a relationship with God, well, start somewhere. Pick a time. Put God on your schedule every single day day. For me, I've been doing this. My pattern is to do it first thing in the morning. I've been doing that for about 29 years now. I'm not in Daniel territory, but I can say it's not a have to. It has become a want to. These kind of spiritual habits, they do something in us. They connect us with God deeply and personally. Go there. Develop habits like that. Life-changing. What well, continues, verses 12 through 15, Daniel continues to pray. They rat Daniel out. The king, he liked Daniel, so he tries to find a loophole to get Daniel out of it, but can't find one, so he ends up doing this. Verse 16, so the king gave the order. And they brought Daniel and they threw him into the lion's den. Don't romanticize that. That, it wasn't this. It's not Simba. Okay, it's more along the lines of this. It's it's a lion. Daniel getting thrown into the lion's den isn't some cute little Sunday school lesson. This is actually an ancient judicial practice with this name. It's called a trial by ordeal. Happened fairly regularly in the days of the Old Testament. It worked this way. The accused was put into a life-threatening situation. If they survived, then they were considered to be innocent. But if they didn't survive, then, oh, must be guilty. Trial by ordeal was based on this premise. God protects the innocent by performing miracles on their behalf. This wasn't a different system than we have today. This wasn't innocent until proven guilty. This was guilty. Barring a miracle from God, you're guilty if we say you're guilty. Anyone else glad it's not trial by ordeal anymore? (laughs) Well, verse 16, So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. Trial by, by ordeal. Daniel, is he guilty or is he innocent? Would he live or would he die? The odds were not in his favor. Verse 19, At the first light of dawn, The king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, May the king live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me, because I was found innocent in his sight. Innocent, saved, delivered, rescued. Are you in a situation like Daniel today? Are you in a lion's den? Are you facing a challenge? Are you struggling with a problem? Are you dealing with an issue? 
Because whatever it is, it is not above and it is not beyond the capacity of God. God is stronger than our lions. And God, he is bigger than our adversaries. And God, he is greater than our challenges. Case in point, he came to earth. He was rejected, he was crucified, he died. He was placed in a den. He was placed in a tomb. But he didn't stay there. On the third day, resurrected life, power, hope. Don't give up just because you're facing a lion. The power of God works best when we need him the most. And maybe that's the part of this passage that God is speaking to you through today. If you're facing a lion, you know, don't give up. Put your faith, put your hope, put your confidence, put it in him. He's good like that. But that's not how this story ends. So we're going to keep going. Verse 24. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den, along with their wives and children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. I don't know about you, but I prefer my Daniel and the lion's den story without the little kid's bones getting crushed. But it's in here. And notice this. The people who got thrown into the den, that wasn't because God wanted that. That wasn't because God ordered that. That was because, well, the king ordered that. The Bible isn't advocating that, but it is showing us those lions they weren't vegetarians. Well, this, I think, goes a little bit beyond where we typically go with the story of Daniel in the lion's den, but it's in here. Do you know this still isn't the end of this story? I imagine a lot of you, you know, you hear Daniel 6, you're like, oh yeah, I know that one. I'm familiar with Daniel in the lion's den. Let me ask you this. Do you know how the story of Daniel in the lion's den, do you know how it ends? Because it doesn't end with Daniel getting out of the den. That's actually incomplete. There's more to it than that. Here's what it ends with. Verse 26. This is the king speaking. He says, I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. See this? There, there are a few main characters in Daniel 6. There's the lions. It's important. We face challenges in life. Not the only character. There's also this king. The king is actually the one who we see has changed through this chapter. The king Something happens inside of him. And then there's also Daniel. These three characters. Daniel, what we see in chapter 6, Daniel's faith changed this king. Because this didn't end with a letter. A few years later, in this same empire, and likely the same king, because Darius, he's also known by the name Cyrus. Cyrus the Great. You will find this in your world history books. Cyrus issued a decree allowing the Hebrew slaves and exiles to go free. They'd been in exile 70 years. Cyrus, shortly after the lion's den, he's like, hey, you guys who fear this God, you are free. You can go. You can go back to Jerusalem. This is a pretty amazing part of the Old Testament. This, it's like Moses and the Exodus without Moses. It's a second Exodus. In this one, there's no confrontation. There's no plagues. 
there's no Red Sea. It's just an 80-year-old Daniel who kept on praying. Who said, I'm not giving up my spiritual habit of connecting with God. Isn't that cool? See, do you see this? This is big. This is important. The story of Daniel in the lion's den is often misunderstood. Daniel in the lion's den is not a promise that God will save us from every single lion. It's not a promise that we're never going to get bit. It's not that. God can Sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't. He did for Daniel, but he didn't for Ignatius, and he didn't for John the Baptist, and he didn't for Paul. Daniel in the lion's den is about one old man who didn't stop following the way of the Lord, even when it seemed like everyone around him did. And the faithfulness of this one man, the daily faithfulness of this one man, changed the world. So well, how? Dan- changed the world. How did Daniel change the world? Well, Daniel was different. We, we don't see anywhere in here. Daniel's not out on a street corner telling people to repent. That, not in here. Daniel doesn't have a bullhorn in this story. Daniel, he's not wearing any kind of cheesy Christian t-shirt. There's no social media hashtag. What is it? What is it with Daniel? Well, it's this. It's what's in him. What turns this whole story around, what it is that changes the heart of this mighty king, it's who this Daniel is. Daniel's life, Daniel's quiet faith softened the heart of this mighty king and attracted him to the Lord. There's no law against following Jesus today. We don't live under the threat of death or persecution. There's no lion's dens. It's more of a soft discrimination, a subtle pressure to conform, to do what everyone else is doing, to believe what everyone else is believing, to live the way everyone else is living, to to blend in, to be normal. That is not the life that Jesus calls us to live. Jesus put it this way, Matthew 5, 14, he said, you are the light of the world. Jesus recognized there are lions out there There's darkness out there, and I have an answer for that. I have a solution for that. Jesus says, it's you. It's you. You're called to be the light. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, read the rest of this with me. Let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. That's what happened with Daniel. The king was pretty close to him, and he saw there is something about this guy that is incredibly different. People around Daniel, the king, the satraps, the administrators, they all knew Daniel's faith was central to who he was. And I think that God is is asking us a question like this. Does anyone in your life, do the people around you, know that you are a follower of Jesus? People knew that about Daniel. Do the people around you know that about you? You know, your neighbor, the other soccer parents, The employees, the guy who sits next to you in class, can they tell that your life is different? And not in a rigid, moralistic kind of way, but demonstrating an alternative to the ways and to the gods of this world. Different values, different priorities, a different 
Spirit. Can they tell that you follow Jesus? One of the high profile issues in, in years past around this time of year as, as we move toward Christmas has been whether you know, schools and companies and retailers use the word Merry Christmas or use the word Happy Holidays. And I don't know where you stand on that issue, but I'm pretty certain that the mission of Jesus isn't going to hinge on our ability to strong arm retail employees into saying Merry Christmas against their wills. I don't think Walmart ought to proclaim the love of Jesus. I think the follower of Jesus ought to proclaim that message. That, that's our job. People will be drawn to Jesus, not when we impose the language of Jesus, but rather when we actually live like Jesus when we notice and value the people that others ignore, when we take time to listen to somebody who's hurting, when we befriend the person that everybody else is picking on, when we offer forgiveness, when we encourage a person who's discouraged, when we demonstrate integrity and honesty and humility, even when others don't, when we use our resources to help people in need, when we offer love, when they don't expect it, and when they least deserve it, that, that says something. That gets people's attentions to say, why would anyone do something, why would anyone do something like that? Daniel changed the world. How? He, he, he didn't have a bullhorn, and he didn't give a sermon. It was it was him. It was how he lived. He lived like Jesus lived and people noticed. How about you? Does anybody know that you're a follower of Jesus? How can they tell? <laughs>